Welcome to Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik, where we bring you news, politics, and culture without the red and blue treatment. My name is Michelle Witte. I'm here with my co-host, Bob Schlehuber. It is Wednesday, August 11th, the middle of the longest week, honestly. Only Wednesday, Bob. It's Wednesday already? Oh, my God. (laughs) Sometimes we see things differently here. We sure do. Um, but you know what we never do, Bob, is see him through the red and the blue, right? That's right, true. right. A little hey. promo. Anyway, time to go against the grain here. We are talking about a lot of stuff today. Uh, we're talking about Israel and Hezbollah, some tossing some rockets back and forth. Uh, we will get into just how badly a lot of Americans really misunderstand the Middle East and uh, whether some common reporting patterns contribute to that. Uh, newsflash, I think that they do. We're going to talk about Apple scanning the cloud for child pornography and the controversy uh, that announcement has churned up. We're going to talk about AI and old scratch himself, Henry Kissinger, and why one is connected to the other via Google. We're going to talk about Lionel Messi. And of course, Bob is going to talk just about the Cubs, 100% Cubs in the second hour. Apparently, I'm not quite sure. The whole hour. The whole hour, just Bob sighing. Sighing and, and hugging himself, holding it's, it's himself. It's frustrating because it's a labor dispute. And that's what's tough is when you see a team you love and you got to remember it's made up of a billionaire family with a ton of money, but then millionaire players. And so it's hard to look through that to understand that there's a labor dispute taking place. It's a labor dispute of love. <sighs> it's anything but love as my 2016 Cubbies. Michelle, this is for the second hour. You oh, get me okay, started sorry. here. Yeah, Slow we have to down. start the first hour. Sorry, Slow Bob. Slow down sorry. first. Just, you, you start know. with, hey, Bob, glad you're here to Great to see you. Great haircut. Your hair looks terrific. This Thank is now you. the Whoa, fourth slow time down. I've Whoa, said that Michelle. today. Bob, you know what? You make that hair look good. <laughs> no, beautiful haircut, Bob, as I noted as soon as I walked into the office this morning. Oh, Looking great. You. How are you? I Well, I feel great now that you've given me that compliment. Oh, so, well, you're very thanks. welcome. I feel good, too. Obviously, you were a great support. Big shout out to Michelle Witte helping me this morning as I navigated the depths of hell of dental insurance. Oh, the word truly, truly. I do appreciate nightmarish. it. Michelle did some extra work covering for me because she saw that I would have lost my mind otherwise as I was calling different dental companies. And you'd think that there would be like different rates for costs depending on what dentist you're at. Yeah. But then they base it off of the insurance and they get the insurance rate. So if you have insurance, you actually get like a discounted cost with the dentist. Just meaning again, if you're in this country and you don't have insurance, you're screwed. You're absolutely screwed. So even if you've maxed out whatever the insurance will cover for you, you still get a, a, a cheaper rate just for having it. And so you, and if you just, couldn't afford it, what do you do with your teeth? The other thing is that it's not just you. You know, again, I was overseas for a very long time. I would come back and spend time in the United States. And during those periods of time, I would usually not have insurance. Yeah. And I didn't really think there very much of it because, you know, generally healthy. And I was younger at the time. And you don't think anything bad will ever happen to right. you. And the thing that I that finally... Um, you know, really change some of that for me is realizing if something catastrophic happens to me while I'm here uh, and I need to pay for some kind of urgent surgery, you know, something that you can't you you can't avoid. It's not just me. It's my whole family goes bankrupt. You know what mm. I mean? So it's like my mom and dad are going to be like, oh, you don't really Sorry, need like yeah. surgery for that broken pelvis or whatever. So then it just cascades down the line. It's everybody you love is going to be affected. And that was what really made me, you know, one, take insurance a lot more seriously because I didn't want my mom and dad to go broke if, if some, you know, if I yeah. got into some kind of accident. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where we start, Michelle. Yep. That's where we start with my toothache. I bit into a piece of hard granola. And that's where things spiraled. Michelle, I got to actually, speaking of your father, I have a message here from your dad. I find that hard to believe. He wanted to let you know that he's apologized. And let's have a listen here. Here's the uh, apology from, I, I guess, your father who sent this in. Your dad made mistakes and he apologized and he learned from it. And that's what life is all about. Well, I'm going to tell you one thing about my father, yes. Bob, and uh, that is that he would never speak of himself in the third person. Okay. So I'm pretty sure that's uh, your boy, America's former daddy, <laughs> Andrew Cuomo. <laughs> that was Andrew. That. Now that you say that, it did sound a lot like Andrew Cuomo. Yeah, maybe he's been in the news more than my father. This Weird week. he was speaking in third person. Yeah. And why was he talking about being a father when he resigned yesterday from being governor because of a state? He's the father of New York, Bob. What a creep, too. Yes. I love you heard his voice ever so slightly bright there, too. Oh, my your God. Da- your daddy. Your daddy's 
I mean, Daddy's broken up. I mean, what a strange, bizarre, and obviously pretty creepy man Andrew Cuomo turned out to be. Who would have thought? Can I play? Let me play. Let me just play. I want to play the thirty seconds that came before that. And as a woman here, I just want to get your oh, response great. to it, specifically the woman part of you here. Okay, can, I, cool. can I play this little clip here for you, Michelle? Because just bonkers. Have a listen. I want my three jewels to know this. My greatest goal is for them to have a better future than the generations of women before them. It is still in many ways a man's world. It always has been. We have sexism that is culturalized and institutionalized. My daughters have more talent and natural, natural gifts than I ever had. I want to make sure, sh- sure that society allows them to fly as high as their wings will carry them. Uh, Michelle is a woman with wings. How high do you <laughs> hope to fly? <laughs> yes, I would. I am actually pretty upset that I didn't get my wings. I didn't yeah. know that we were supposed to have them. I love like, the romanticization of a man who's resigning for sexual harassment at women, then has of the women of saying it's a man's world, crazy out here. I don't have any. I don't have any part of creating this man's world. And then to be I, like, and they have angel. They have wings. They yeah, fly. These right. soft we're little d- beautiful gems of mine will fly. Fly into say it's like, oh we my. should have the same, you know, the the same expectations and the same responsibilities and the same opportunities. And also, you're very special. You're, so you're cute, very you special. Gems with wings. The other thing I want to say is, if he wants his daughters to have uh, better futures than the women that came before them, uh, maybe don't do things like cut healthcare spending. You know what I mean? Because the generation that came before his daughters could uh, contemplate having children a lot more readily than their generation can because they simply cannot afford it. So just think about that practical stuff. You know, that that is what actually affects people's lives in Cuomo. You absolute scumbag. Yeah. Pretty ironic here. Katie Hochul will become New York's first female governor. Getting all this play like, ooh, wow, a female. She did it. Broke the glass. (laughs) Like, not how she should have got in there i mean or just whatever fine like somebody steps down and the person behind them steps in but yeah Doesn't it wasn't they didn't, uh, she, they, she wasn't elected <laughs> although she was elected as lieutenant governor i suppose sure, sure. right i suppose that's a ticket thing i do not actually know but but anyway so, disgusting know, i thought it was disgusting you know you get these people get caught up and then play feminist hero or in racial cases you get somebody dropping the n-word and the next thing you know they're joining the ncaa CP speaking up for racial equality. I, yeah, it's just like, I, that's not who I am. I'm not that womanizer. I'm somebody that stands up for my daughters. I sure I might have thrown acid at the black person, but I love black people. That's yeah. not me on a normal day. Okay. And so it's just like, well, no, we all know who you are. You're not some guy that's trying to break down gender inequality. You're the guy that was creepishly hitting on your colleagues and on police and other people. Like you're the, you're the creepy guy that's causing the problems. You're not all of a sudden diagnosing the problem and saying, here's the solution to it. Here's the solution. And it's the me. other, the other clip making the rounds today in regards to Cuomo's resignation is Brian Stetler, CNN's chief media correspondent. He was on Stephen Colbert's show last night and in the interview on the late show, Stetler is asked by Stephen Colbert, about Chris Cuomo, what CNN colleagues make of it all, what is going to be the next step CNN takes towards Chris Cuomo. And here's Stetler's response. And he talks a little bit about Cuomo's actions, how he feels about it, and how he feels about the ethics, the journalistic ethics involved in it. Here, have a listen to Brian Stetler on The Late Show from last night. Some people are mad at him. By the way, I can confirm the New York Times report. I'll, I'll confirm it for your viewers. I also have a source that says Chris was on the phone with his brother this week. Is your source Chris him. Cuomo? He is not. He is not. You got to have boundaries. You got to draw a line. Why? Oh, he do doesn't? Uh, I think he does, actually. Really? I think Chris does. I don't know about the governor. What are the boundaries? I think Chris does. What are the boundaries? The boundary that, that CNN management presented to him in May when, when they admitted he screwed up. They said, yeah. you know, what you did was inappropriate. You were on the phone with your brother's aides advising them on what to do. And that was inappropriate. But they said, of course you're going to talk to your brother. You know, there's nothing more important. But he than didn't talk about about his brother once the trouble started. He That's said, right. I'm not going to talk about my brother. And that was also a management ruling. And so the but way I why didn't I they rule that way when his brother was on the show pretty much every night? Uh, during the yeah, COVID crisis. I think it's really that complicated. That seems like an odd uh, conflict of rules. It is an odd conflict, but I don't think uh, if we open up the journalism ethics book, there's no page for this. It's the, the craziest set of circumstances you can imagine. Yes. There is. There is. There is. That, that seems sure like there. between journalist and family member, there obviously is ethics in the journalistic ethics book, Michelle. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, that's, I don't know. I can't, Stephen Colbert made the point very well. Oh, he said he wasn't going to talk about him, talk to his brother 
talk about his brother when things were going badly, but perfectly fine to ham it up on this major network uh, every single night when things are going well. And also this, uh, yeah, it's all Andrew's fault. (laughs) Chris Cuomo has entirely appropriate professional boundaries and Andrew Cuomo forced him to advise on him. Andrew Cuomo broke into the studio and sat down in the chair and forced Chris Cuomo to talk to him live every night. I, it's ridiculous. And also Brian Stetler did the same thing that they do, uh, the, they, right, these mainstream guys do on, on every issue, which is to say it's complicated. It's complicated. No, right? I mean, it's not yeah. complicated, Bob. Yeah, no, I thought it was it was pretty good. Stephen Colbert has been pretty trash here in the Biden era regarding attacking Donald Trump, but a good interview there. And then for Brian Stetler to be like, yeah, I have some sources that see you're the chief. I mean, it's gotta just like you're, you're lines, <laughs> gotta have boundaries, boundaries and lines. You're the chief media correspondent at CNN, bro. Like, yeah. I mean, ridiculous. Michelle, speaking of complete idiots, I, you gotta, I gotta play this, this back and this call and response, I guess, back and forth, not so much, but Senator Tommy Tuberville, big Trumpian guy, former football coach, Republican down there in Alabama, spoke on the Senate floor yesterday and Democratic Senator Cory Booker responded to what Tuberville said. And, you know, folks that you'd hope work would be at work working to respond to climate change, poverty issues, issues of war and peace, I don't know, blah, 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 boring yeah, sure. stuff like that. They'd be hard at work, right. especially when we have things that are facing us as like existential crisis, like the end of the planet. You think they'd be doing that, but no, instead they played dress up and political theater yesterday. So yesterday on the Senate floor, the Republican party kept introducing non-binding amendments. That was an attempt to slow down the legislative process to continue to hold up the infrastructure spending bills, which was okay. just passed just a little bit ago this morning, the three and a half trillion dollar Democrat only bill also passed the Senate. So these are big hurdles jumped over at least for Joe Biden to get these infrastructure bills done. Now they go to the House, thin margins there. So we'll see if they're able to hold on. But anyways, in an attempt, the Republicans start introducing these dumb amendments and try to grandstand. So you have Tuberville introducing a non-binding amendment that would punish localities that defund the police. So he's like, I'm going to get them. I'm going to put this out here just so that the Democrats had to vote against the amendment. So then the Republicans could be like, see, right there, they want to defund the police. Okay. So the Republicans had this narrative, Democrats want to defund the police. They hate the police. Right. They want to get rid of all the police. And so Tuberville was like, I'll put this amendment forward and we are going to get them on vote. Okay. So have a listen here first to uh, Tommy Tuberville around what his amendment would do. I call on my colleagues to support our law enforcement by voting yes for this amendment. Opposing my amendment is a vote in support of defunding the police and against the men and women in blue. So what do you think the Democrats did? Did they get pigeonholed by Republicans as anti-police? Well, of course they didn't because they love the police. They went ahead and voted 99 to 0 in favor of punishing localities who look to defund the police. So again, this is not binding. It's just political theater. And so maybe... Maybe if you want to give Democrats some credit here, they were simply denying a rhetorical position to the Republicans, which, of course, they will use anyway. So it doesn't even matter how you vote. The Republicans will do what you want. So it was all really dumb and a waste of time. But things got really annoying, like bash your head against the wall annoying when Senator from New Jersey, Cory Booker, rose to speak in response to Tuberville and this amendment. Have a listen here to Cory Booker. Senator from New Jersey. I am so excited. This is perhaps the highlight of this long and painful and torturous night. This is a gift. If it wasn't complete abdication of Senate procedures and and, and esteem, I would walk over there and hug my colleague from Alabama. And I will tell you right now, thank God, because there's some people who have said that they're members of this deliberative body that want to defund the police, to my horror. And now this senator has given us the gift that finally, once and for all, we can put to bed this scurrilous accusation that somebody in this great esteemed body would want to defund the police. What? So let crawl all out of my us, skin. 100 people, not walk, but sashay down there and vote for this amendment and put to rest the lies. And I am sure I will see no political ads attacking anybody here over defund the police. And I would. Shut up. <laughs> Just shut up. I like that call out to Kristen Cinema. Let's sashay down there. And, and he got lost. The like, he, was, he actually said the horror. The horror. Right? He was, you know, he's trying to be somewhat satirical because then he's also trying to play against the Republicans. Like, oh, was my it? God, fine. Republicans there. You happy? We said it. We love the police. I, I'm sure I'll never see 
an ad from any of you again saying that we're against the police. And so Cory Booker is trying to like own the Republicans and be like, ha, got ya. I bet you'll not. Whatever. And so Cory it's just Booker's dumb. never owned anyone in his entire <laughs> life. <laughs> I know. So then he ends up looking at an idiot because he basically admits that all of the Democratic Party from the left wing of the party to the right wing of the party are all pro police and not a single one of them. <sighs> yep. Yep. I mean, it's embarrassing. And the guy's like a starting lineup for the Democratic Party. He's like one of their top notch people. Like he comes to like a event like, oh, we got Cory Cory Booker's here tonight, guys. Cool. It is also showing that. I don't know. It's all theater. You know, like this is all. Yeah, just do something. Do something. (laughs) Just. Well, don't. Well, they did something. They voted ninety nine. To zero on but I mean, on a non-binding amendment, you know what I mean? Like, the, I don't know, use it as a, OK, have a conversation then. Talk about like what defunding the police actually means and why would you punish these? You know what I mean? And what it means to withhold money from municipalities and what that money could be used for and how idiotic this is. Right. There are lots of ways you could own Tuberville for this dumb amendment. But no, it's got to be like, let's let's own him by showing how much we want to hug every cop we see. Just what else is out there, Michelle? Grim. What else is out there today? Uh, well, I'm, first of all, it's Sebastian Bach. Sebastian Bach, you know, take care. D. Snyder already, not Sebastian Bach getting COVID. Also saying, you know, I've been vaccinated. Thank God for the vaccine. I feel fine. But, you know, Brett Michaels, keep your masks up. Just if you were in a hairband in the 80s or, or 90s, just f- from me, take care. Go hang on a little bubble together. Don't get sick. <laughs> and the, the, the unsick people hang out yeah. in a little bubble. I don't want to see them start dropping. It's too soon. Um, I also have a little bit of an update if we have time from the preliminary hearing on the uh, the U.S. government's appeal of the ruling in the Assange extradition case, Bob. Would you like me to lay that on you? It is a mouthful. This is reporting from Kevin Gostola of Shadowproof, who followed the hearing. Basically, um, the U.S. government was challenging two grounds for appeal that it was denied initially. So the U.S. government is allowed to appeal on a bunch of other grounds, but it wanted to be able to appeal also on these other two grounds. And it was the original barrister's ruling on Assange's risk of suicide and um, that it should be able to challenge the evidence given by one expert as to Assange's mental health, right? And so one part of the U.S.'s argument here is that the evidence given by a, a key psychiatric expert that the judge relied on because he had had the most access to Julian Assange the most recently, that that should be thrown out because that doctor was aware Assange had two children and didn't make that information public. So they're basically saying all of his testimony should be uh, invalidated because he was swayed by fears for the safety of Assange's wife and children to keep their existence private. And I mean, you know, given the lengths that very powerful governments have gone to to pressure and ultimately capture Assange, I, I don't see how you could blame the guy for not wanting to be the one to alert the world of the existence of these people. But uh, anyway, the U.S. won. And so now in it, this is a preliminary hearing for the appeal. So now it will be given an even wider scope to challenge that ruling. Right. So they will not, as I understand it, they will not only be able to challenge the the application of of uh, laws here, but they will also be able to challenge facts that the first judge already weighed and decided on. So not a victory for Assange, but still the very early stages of this process. And of course, in the meantime, Julian Assange remains in Belmarsh prison, Ugh. separated from his family as this drags on. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a win for the U.S. government. To, I mean, he's just in jail. I mean, obviously they want yeah. him here, but what difference does it make to them at the end of the day as long as he's in a small cage somewhere? Absolutely horrific news there in the case of Julian Assange. Michelle, with that, let's take our first break of the hour. In the first hour, we'll be talking about the crisis in Lebanon, the cross-border flare-up with Israel last week and reporting in the United States on both Israel and Lebanon. We'll also talk about why Apple customers are raising privacy concerns over an announcement the company made last week. If that's not enough, don't you worry, Misfits. We have a second hour for you after that. You listen to Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik. We're live in D.C., and we're back after this. Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik, where we bring you news, politics, and culture without the red and blue treatment. 
I'm Michelle Witte here with Bob Schlehuber, turning our attention now to the Middle East, where <laughs> there's a lot going on. Uh, last week, we had rocket fire between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon. We, of course, have the deepening economic and political crisis in Lebanon. We have a, a slight breath of fresh air in The New York Times uh, when it comes to its coverage of Israel. So we got a lot of news to catch up on. Here to help us with all of it is Mitchell Plitnick political analyst, writer, and president of Rethinking Foreign Policy. Mitchell, thanks for joining us. Glad to be back. So let's start with this uh, exchange of rocket fire over the border or, you know, between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon last week. It's the first time in a very long time uh, that there have been such exchanges, as I understand it. So what do we know about what sparked that exchange and, uh, and why it stopped? Well, we're still not clear uh, which uh, group. The, the first shot apparently was fired from Lebanon, uh, and, and it's not 100% clear which group it was, although everyone seems to believe, and, and I see no reason to doubt, that it was a Palestinian uh, militia at, operating out of uh, out of Lebanon. And it, it mm. makes a little bit of sense, I think, right now for, for, that, to, for that to happen, um, simply because um, of the transition in Israel, in government, as well as uh, the fact that, that uh, there's, on the one hand, sort of a, a, an increased, uh, say, skepticism maybe about Israeli intentions towards the Palestinians mm-hmm. in the world. And, and yet, at the same time, um, we're now a couple of months removed from the latest assault on Gaza, and, and again, that issue has moved out of the headlines. So it, it makes some sense that there would be some rocket fire from a Palestinian group. Uh, but uh, what what happened in response was Israel uh, targeting an open area with a few rockets just basically in their uh, knee-jerk, normal, routine response. Um, I think the more interesting part of it was Hezbollah um, also targeting an open space in Israel, which I think sent two messages. One, that yes, their, their main Maintaining their uh, what, what their policy of responding to Israel proportionately, mm-hmm. uh, and two, I think they were also reminding Israel, uh, and I, I think this message was muted in the media, but I think it probably got through to Israeli leadership very clearly. Uh, they were reminding Israel that they are not Hamas, that they have rockets that they can aim, uh, yeah. and and they will go where they want. Israel very much did acknowledge that uh, Hezbollah clearly targeted an open area, was clearly trying to avoid an escalation which is true. Mm -hmm. Uh, Both sides were trying to avoid escalation here. Mm -hmm. Uh, Neither side really needs uh, growing conflict at this time. So uh, now, you know, there are also other reasons for Hezbollah to have tried to make an assertive uh, or send an assertive message uh, uh, in their own domestic politics, um, which is which we can get into. Well, yeah, let's get into that then. Yeah, talk about, you know, what what are some of those reasons and what what connections would you draw between uh, conditions in Lebanon and possibly conditions in Israel, which has sort of gotten overshadowed by the enormous crisis in Lebanon? Sure. Um, So again, I think uh, in Israel, you have a, uh, you have obviously a new government that, uh, wants to, you know, Natalia Bennett wants to very much reassure the Israeli public that he's going to be as, quote-unquote, strong on security as Netanyahu was. I don't think uh, that the book on that in the Israeli public's mind is, is at all closed. I think they're still waiting to see. There's, there's been a lot of early murmurings that Bennett is not exactly asserting the sort of leadership Netanyahu did. Uh, I think that's probably accurate. Uh, and I would also, from my point of view, say it's a good thing. But mm-hmm. there, so there's there's reasons why uh, Hezbollah would want to test Israel right now. Uh, but historically, Hezbollah's popularity has rested on, on two things. And one is the deterrence of Israel in, in southern Lebanon, the idea that they, they were largely responsible for get, ending Israel's occupation of southern Lebanon and have been able to stop Israel from coming back since. And the other is that uh, as a sort of force of a particular kind of Shia Lebanese nationalism, and that's really faded. That, and in, especially in light of the recent events, they are very much a part of the problem in the uh, Lebanese government, uh, as are pretty much every part, as is pretty much every party in the government right. uh, at this time that has led to this economic collapse. But they're a very powerful piece of the of the government, so they are they are really, I think, feeling some of the heat, and I think they wanted to remind people in Lebanon that they were the sort of bulwark against uh, against Israel. 
I'm not sure that that message was really very well received, at least not by all sectors of the of, of Lebanon. Hezbollah has decided to be more of a regional actor, uh, and I think their willingness to be a sort of a, a, a deputy, in a sense, to Iran has grown over the past 10 or 15 years, and I think they're suffering domestically in Lebanon for that. Uh, it used to be really a very much a Lebanese organization fighting for Shia, Shia rights in Lebanon and uh, and for their position and defending Lebanon against the West and, and particularly Israel. But um, I think that's changed a bit over the past few years, and that is something that they are seemingly ignoring in Lebanon. Public, the, the, the public opinion of, of the Lebanese people is not as strongly supportive of them as it used to be. You know, I wanted to ask you, you alluded to something here that I wanted to, to get into a little bit further. And I, that's the way reporting um, distinguishes between Lebanon, you know, as a state, and Hezbollah. Uh, you know, there's rockets fired between Hezbollah and Israel rather than between Lebanon and Israel. And I think that, I mean, as you mentioned, obviously, you know, Hezbollah is not the Lebanese state, but it is a part of that state, right? And it is a very significant part of that state. And so I wonder how, if you think that sometimes it gets, it becomes unhelpful to the American understanding of what is actually happening there to act as though there is a very thick division between the two, you know, instead of talking about, you know, an organization that is very much part of, you know, in the mix of the the governance of Lebanon and the state apparatus. Yeah, I, I do think that the Western uh, and particularly American coverage of Hezbollah uh, gives the impression that they are a, an outside group. Uh, a, a, obviously, they're designated a terrorist group. Uh, by the United States for quite a while, and, and it, 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 it gives that sort of feel of a group that operates um, outside the law, outside the government, and that, that isn't true. On the other hand, um, I do think it's important that, that people understand that when Hezbollah acts, the Hezbollah military, the, the, there's, you know, the military wing and the political wing, the Hezbollah military wing, which is what we're talking about here with the yeah. is, they, when they act, they're only answerable to Hezbollah's leadership. They are not acting on behalf of the Lebanese state. And I think that that is a really important distinction uh, to make. So I, I think you're right. There's a loss of nuance here that's important um, in, in the sense that this, the way it's covered gives people the impression that Hezbollah is somehow uh, outside of the Lebanese power structure outside of official, quote unquote, official Lebanon. Yeah. And, you know, that I acts against them, I guess. I mean, I think this comes down to the way a lot of a lot of these organizations are, are treated in media, where it's, it's it, the fact that they have uh, supporters in the public, you know, who would not consider it a favor for that organization to be removed is really obscured. And so any U- U.S. actions against them are treated as something that would be sort of welcomed by the population against this sort of alien force that they, too, dislike instead of being a lot more complicated than that. I think that's true, but I think also that there, there's there's a real danger in tying them too closely to the Lebanese government. Israel mm-hmm. often, like, the, for example, when when the rockets uh, rocket exchange happened, Israel stated that they hold Lebanon. They were very specific about this. They hold Lebanon responsible for mm-hmm. the rockets. They did not say Hezbollah very intentionally. Mm-hmm. And I think that is a, something that we want to be able to raise our voices again. Yeah. Be able to say, look, the, the, the Lebanese government is not doing this. Yes, a part of the government's military wing is doing this, but that military wing is not answerable to the whole government, yeah. not controlled by the whole government. Um, and yes, the government could maybe take it on. That would be civil war. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we want to be able, I think it's really important to maintain that distinction. And I I think what you're looking at is more a flaw in just the way we deal with news in general. Mm -hmm. Um, We, you know, our 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 whole media is set up uh, in a way to that obscures uh, any sort of real nuance and a deeper understanding of of, um, particularly political issues. And I I mean, fat enough political issues here. Yes. Yes. Basically, it's it's even worse for political issues in other countries. No, I think so. I think so, too. And I think we're going to get into some of that uh, in a little bit, I think, with regard to reporting on Israel. But before we do that, just can you update us on what is actually what is happening in in 
Lebanon. You know, we had protests again last week. We have reports of people losing their lives in fights over fuel. Um, We spoke on this show a week or so ago to a journalist in Beirut who described how hyperinflation is pushing the basic necessities of life out of reach for uh, Lebanon's middle class. Uh, And so I wonder, you know, a a week later, what does life look like in the country and where are people focusing their frustration? Yeah, so I mean, it's not just um, it's not just that, you know, the hyperinflation is indeed uh, pushing basic necessities out of reach. But not only that, the uh, Lebanese, the Lebanese pound has been compl- has lost like over eighty percent of its value. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, and and what's worse is fuel shortages have led to uh, if people are lucky, they're getting an hour of power a day, uh, and that's including in places like hospitals and you know they're, they're getting a little obviously they're getting a little more preferential treatment, but not not enough. Um, and, you know, even things that maybe we don't consider, like um, how do people get to work? They can't get fuel for their cars. Yeah. Um, they can't get to work. They can't get fuel. You know, there, there's not fuel available for taxis or ride shares or, or things like that. Um, people can't get to work. Kids can't get to school. One of the, um, I think, a really great report I just read that was very, I think, uh, eye-opening talked about how, you know, how disruptive this has been to kids' education. They cannot get to school. Yeah. Simply no way for them to do it. The teachers can't get to their job. And it's not like they can do what we did with COVID lockdown. The, the, um, the, uh, first of all, power is just not available. And even where it is, um, broadband has been completely slowed down. You can't do online school there. It's just not, it's just not physically possible. So you have um, a really, really grim economic situation, and it's one where there's a catch-22 because the internet, in, in this case, yeah, the international community has done a lot of harm to Lebanon. Mm-hmm. But I, I have to say, I cannot blame the IMF and the World Bank for saying, look, we're not going to give more money to the same people who just who have been stealing it for the past two decades. Mm-hmm. That's they're basically saying at this point. Um, I'm not trying to toot their horns either. Uh, they are very much um, uh, long-term responsible for a lot of the problems there, as they are in so many other places. Mm-hmm. But that particular point is one I can't really argue with. Yeah. Um, and these and the various factions, even uh, in in the majority and minority coalitions in the Lebanese government, are not are are actually working together to make sure that all of the crimes don't get exposed, and the structure of Lebanese politics based as it is on factionalism, mm-hmm. it's not based on different political, different political views and different political ideologies. Right. Actually, and that's not just political groupings. That's the actual physical structure of the government that was p- imposed post-colonially it makes it virtually impossible for um, any sort of political process to create change. Now, there is and has been a growing uh, protest movement, but even that is very, very scattered. It has had a very hard time uniting on on a common platform and common ideology because it's coming from such different places in a country that's used to sectarianism. So I, I, I find actually one might argue that there are countries in worse shape than Lebanon, but I find very few where there seems to be so so many obstacles. To, to any sort of positive outcome. And also just contemplating going from relative stability and, re- you know what I mean, relative calm, some prosperity. The the drop has been precipitous. And that to me is always really jarring, right? Because suddenly you have people plunged into a, a crisis that they d- don't know how to handle, right? And have, having, you know, it's not a sort of slow grind where you, you have time to figure things out as they go along. That to me is really frightening. Um, I want to follow up on what, what, what uh, you said. I think international media has done great harm to, to Lebanon. Uh, talk to me about that. Why do, you, why do you attribute some harm to the way the country is reported on? Talk about, I was talking about international uh, institutions. So. Oh, OK. All right. And then I get it. <laughs> it's like, oh, he's going off on a new tangent here. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's hard to get your head around uh, what people must be doing there. And what? Yeah, sounds, and the other thing so is scary. what? I don't know. I, 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 what is the solution? What, like, where is relief to come from for people who are who are suffering there, Mitchell? I, I don't have any idea. So I'm sorry if I'm asking you a, an impossible question here. Yeah, I, I, well, that, that's kind of what I was saying before is I just I, I'm rarely 
so at a loss to to come up with a scenario where things can work out, even in an ideal world. Yeah. Even if, if certain conditions change, but um, you know, Lebanon, I think, is a place that is you know because of the nature of its government sectarian nature, uh, intentionally sectarian nature of its government. Um, it's, it's to, and the fact that the different uh, representatives of all the different groups are so corrupt that they're willing to help each other cover up their own crimes yeah. uh, at the expense of solving any of these problems. I, I honestly, I don't really know what, uh, outside of a complete meltdown and total restructuring of the way things work in Lebanon. Um, I just, I don't know what the, what the more positive way forward is other than, you know, a long haul where, you know, younger people are coming together with new and different ideas and literally just take the country over. That's only starting now. And that's a long, long road. Yeah. It does seem like a, a, a long road, no matter what. Uh, let's learn, turn to uh, another <laughs> intractable problem. No, maybe not. I, I think this was an, an interesting thing this morning, a, a sort of one-two punch in today's New York Times uh, in, in the editorial uh, or the opinion pages. We have Peter Beinart contributing a piece titled America Needs to Start Telling the Truth About Israel's Nukes, which caught my attention because, you know, it is always nice to see a little bit of honesty about Israel in these papers, and also notably within that column, some honesty from Beinart about the way uh, the current Democratic leadership is also involved in obscuring uh, the the nuclear truth, right? And so, you know, when I first saw it and read that headline, I thought, you know, we've been talking on this show for a while about how public opinion, certainly at least, seems to be shifting, right? toward people being a little bit tired about being lied to about our ally in the Middle East and becoming more sympathetic to, you know, cries from Palestinian groups to, to have their human rights recognized, to, to be able to live with more dignity than they are afforded right now. And then just a few columns down, we had Brett Stevens writing about the cheap and easy sanctimony about Ben and Jerry or of Ben and Jerry, uh, mad that Ben and Jerry has said they're not going to sell in the West Bank anymore. And so I wanted to just get your thoughts on this on this combination uh, and and whether you see what we've been talking about here for a while, that this this sort of shift in public opinion is continuing and, and what it will take maybe to make policy follow that shift. Well, I, I think first of all, I mean, it's. It, I think it's great that Peter's uh, uh, op-ed is is in the Times. I, I I think that in a you know in a perfect media environment, or at least what I would consider a, a standard media, what should be a standard media environment, you'd have these different opinions being presented all the time. Mm-hmm. The, the, the reason, and the reason, at least for me, that that you know, I I, I am a little annoyed that Stevens op-ed appears next to Peter's is that Stevens op-ed or, or op-eds like it appear in the times and the Washington post uh, all the time, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Without the, the counterbalance. But having said that this is progress, <laughs> you know, these things don't change overnight. So, um, I, I'm, I'm pleased that it's where it is. Uh, and I, I'm not, you know, I, I, I do think in some ways it may even be beneficial to be able to look at the two together and see just how much more sense Peter makes than, uh, than, than Stevens does. Um, that, that being said, I think, um, also that, that the question of Israeli new, I mean, just look at you, when you just look at the, 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 the subject matter of each op ed, mm-hmm. you're just talking about something really fundamental. Yeah. And how international relations in the Middle East and globally work. The fact that Israel is permitted, uh, uniquely, uniquely permitted to have nuclear weapons that everybody knows about. There's conclusive evidence for decades. Everyone, everyone knows about it. Mm-hmm. It's no, it, it is, you know, the worst kept secret on the planet that Israel has nuclear weapons. Um, that's okay. But, uh, you know, but then the, the, the point that Brett Stevens is worried about is, oh, look how people pick on the Jews because, mm-hmm. uh, and, and by the way, it's Jews apparently who are picking on the Jews because Ben and Jerry are. Right, exactly. But, um, but how, uh, you know, picking on the Jews because, you know, and, and not selling us ice cream. <laughs> they, I mean, the, the, the difference in these two issues. Yeah. Is, uh, it, it's indescribable that something of that size. I think that's such a good point. I also want to follow up, you know, uh, just one more question here for you. But this tidbit in the Beinart piece, you know, goes to, you know, you describe Israel's nuclear weapons as, you know, the worst kept secret in the world. 
except maybe to a lot of the American public, because, you know, he, he notes in his piece that many Americans find the claim that an Iranian nuke would be an existential threat to Israel plausible because, according to recent polling out of the University of Maryland, barely 50 percent of the United States of of the population knows that Israel has nuclear weapons. A higher percentage thinks Tehran has the bomb. And that is a pretty massive misunderstanding of, you know, of Israel, of Iran, of our relationship with those two countries. And so I wonder if you could just talk, you know, before we let you go about about how misconceptions like these are are fueled, right? And why, if you have a public that is so misinformed, this doesn't engender some soul searching on the part of the New York Times and other organizations that are supposed to be informing them of the reality. Well, I mean, to answer the last question first, the reason it doesn't engender soul searching from the New York Times uh, or the Washington Post or anyone else is because that's not their business. Yeah. Their business is not informing people. Their business is making money. And, and you know, fundamentally, nothing changes in, in our media as long as media organizations' primary goal is to make profit. That's, that's what has to change. And, and other things are not going to change until that does. So um, I, as, as to the why, I think that's why. Mm-hmm. The, um, as to how it happens that um, Americans have this massive misperception, it, it comes to a very basic fact. They never hear about Israeli news. Mm-hmm. They just don't hear about that. I mean, when I say everybody knows, I, I mean everybody who's paying attention. Yes. Um, anybody who actually asks the question. But most people... Don't you know? They just go by what they've heard. They never hear about Israeli news. They hear about Iranian news all the time, even though uh, you know, even though our own intelligence says Iran hasn't pursued them in at least eighteen years, if they were ever really serious uh, about actually acquiring them, rather than just getting to the breakout point, seems more likely to have been their goal. So th- it's just 